I need some traction. You need some traction. Hey everyone, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Boast AI and Traction. Uh, today's session is brought to you by Boast AI Launch Academy in partnership with Founder Institute, Lazaridis Institute, and BCF Ventures. And uh, kick this off with two amazing people that I respect a ton. Pratish, who co-founded Akamai, trading at over $10 billion, now started his own fund uh, at Servin Ventures. And Miloon, who is a serial entrepreneur with CMD, Gitalytics, and Metro Lyrics, and now investing out of Xbox, couldn't have found two better founders who've started and joined their own funds and are now investing. So excited. They're going to show you the ropes and everything you need to know to write checks here today. If you have any questions, type them in the chat or uh, hit the Q&A button and we'll take them either as we go along or we'll take them at the end. So let's kick this off, guys. You know, give us your backstory. Let's uh, start with Miloon. How did you get into this? Yeah, um, so I've been doing startups for a while now. I mean, um, before Metro Lyrics, I did a handful of other ones. The Metro Lyrics was kind of like the first one that made me realize um, the potential of tech and gathering a broad audience. Um, with that company, we were the first ones to create a song lyrics licensing model, which is the same model being used by everybody today. Uh, we got it up to 60 million unique visitors a month and then sold that CBS Interactive. Uh, since then, started up CMD which is a cybersecurity company meant for Linux Enterprise, raised from Google Ventures, doing well, hired a CEO into that one, amazing co-founder, and he's running that now. And the last one is Gitalytics, which was in developer productivity, sold out to Microsoft, uh, which is now known as GitHub Insights. But today I spend most of my time investing with Expo. Uh, Gary Camp, the founder of Expo, is somebody who I've um, gotten to know over the last couple of years. And we've been building companies and investing together for quite a bit of time now. Pratish, your journey has been quite eventful, co-founding a multi-billion dollar company and then starting your own fund. Walk us through that journey from, I guess, uh, in your early 20s, right? Starting Akamai to today, investing. It's, it's a long and... Uh, <laughs> uh, Eventful journey, I guess. I came here from India in 1989. I was 22, you know, masters uh, at that time. Uh, it was the done thing to come here um, and uh, went to USC, then joined Intel for about uh, five and a half years and then uh, decided to go to business school, although I had a baby uh, because I wanted to change the trajectory of my career. Uh, turned out to be the best thing I ever did. It's a long story, but MIT had something called the 50K competition. I got together, you know, I had no money. My wife, you know, my wife I had no, no money. So we had a daycare in the house. And, uh, and so the first child that came to this daycare was this uh, Israeli child whose father was doing a PhD in the laboratory of computer science at MIT, which by the way, gets 1400 applicants a year and they take two. So you gotta be a little bit, you know, uh, slightly smart to get in. Um, and I used to keep bugging Donnie, you know, about uh, about having an idea and entering the 50K competition, which is what we did. We didn't win. Uh, we were not even in the top three, but, you know, at close to $20 billion valuation, I think we did okay. Um, after that, you know, I uh, we got a new CEO. It was the right thing for me to move on. I did another startup that, that fails. And uh, oftentimes you learn more from the stuff that fails than the stuff that succeeds. Um, and then I was an enterprise software um, uh, my whole career. And then in 2007, 2008, I had just turned 40. So you can guess I'm almost 54 now. Um, I, I decided that I would, uh, you know, try venture capital and then, you know, get back to the story of why and how I decided that I would find a partner that's very different from me, um, but somebody that I know well. Uh, so I found Neeraj. Um, and we both decided uh, that we want to do venture capital uh, for our career. But the first thing we want to do is, uh, you know, invest our own money and see how we do before we take other people's money. As Milun and any other investor will tell you, you know, uh, if you lose your own money, you can look in the mirror and say, okay, you know, I lost my money. But losing other people's money, that's a whole different ballgame. So uh, Touchwood, that fund did really well. And on the basis of that, we started our first fund for $20 million in 2012. So that's kind of the journey of how I got it. Milun, you were also investing before you joined XPA, right? Like what made you 
sort of decide that, you know what, um, I'd rather now start investing like casually and then like, you know, join a fund versus starting something else. Yeah. He, he, I mean, it's a very organic thing that happens rather than uh, the active decision of something that I uh, made. I, I think what you realize when you're a founder is time is precious. You could dedicate time to creating, improving your company. You could dedicate time to finding the right talent, working with your team. And the more founders you meet and the other great ideas that you see, you really want to kind of like get involved in some way, but you can't uh, due to time constraints. So I started doing angel investments as kind of like, hey, just like a small way of me getting involved in areas where I wouldn't be able to give as much time. Um, and just being passionate about ideas. Like when you see amazing entrepreneurs doing great things, you want to back them in certain ways. And capital is just one of the many ways that you can do that. Uh, a lot of investing today comes, yes, with capital, but the vast majority of that, that is actually support. Um, so having background where I've been doing on the execution side of startups and then being able to deploy capital but work with founders is really what kind of like led me down that path. So even when I joined the Expa, uh, we spent years building new companies and it's only recently that now we pivoted to doing a full dedicated VC model. Throughout the years, we've invested in amazing companies such as Convoy, uh, doing their seed, buying their domain name. Um, but yeah, it, it's really just like, kind of like that passion of wanting to get involved more, wanting to work with more amazing founders, kind of like let me and Expo down this path. The advice I'm hearing here from both Pratish and Milun is before you start the fund, uh, let's, you know, uh, put your own money. Any advice there for people to just start casually angel investing? Like what should they think of? How should they go about it? Finding deal flow and whatnot? No, I think, look, you, you have to have some kind of differentiated deal flow, right? And, you know, when you start your own firm and raise money from LPs, or join another firm, the number one question you're gonna get is differentiated deal flow, right? Why you? Why should entrepreneurs, how will you find entrepreneurs and why will they pick you, right? So the only way I think, the best way to do that is, is actually having a little bit of track record. It doesn't have to be putting a whole amount of money, but at least the ability to find deals and get into deals, I think is the best way uh, for, for you to stand out as a, as a, as a potential venture capitalist. I also think it's really critical, uh, you know, Milun or me or most people to have some kind of entrepreneurship background only because that helps you with the empathy to deal with founders. I mean, if you have never been in a situation and Milun is nodding his head, he knows, uh, you know, where you've already, even Lloyd, you know very well, right? You, you, you haven't met payroll, you, what are you gonna do, right? I mean, you know, until you have experienced that feeling for yourself, um, I think it's very, very hard to be empathetic with somebody who is. so. You know, you have to be very level-headed in this business. Um, I, I, I view it as a, it's kind of a sine wave where, you know, a bit of a geek. So, but you know, this it's a wave, but there's a lot more down troughs than up troughs, right? And you have to, and you know, this guy, there's entrepreneurs as well, right? I mean, sometimes when you're working on a big deal, you're not happy when it's done. You're just relieved, right? That it's done. So, yeah, so I think that part of it, uh, you know, the, the empathy, working with an entrepreneur, and then yes, differentiated deal flow, I think are critical uh, to starting or joining a fund. I think the other big question that people need to ask themselves is why do they <clears throat> want to do this? Uh, what's motivating them? I, what I find is there's two kinds of VCs. Uh, there's the past founders who just really badly want to be involved with other great entrepreneurs, other great ideas. They want to be part of that building journey of amazing companies. Uh, and then you also have investors who have made a very calculated decision. And it's not to say that one path is right or the other, but the other path is a very calculated decision that it's like, hey, I found a niche here of how I can make some multiple based on the deal flow that I'm receiving or through my network of how I can receive it. And therefore I'm gonna go deploy capital into these specific areas in order to generate return. Um, the, the, having um, the viewpoint of what reasoning you're getting into investing will help you better shape the path of how to get there. What's the ideal founder startup profile that you invest in, Milun, and then Pratish? Like what, what kind of companies interest you guys? Yeah, I mean, we invest early. So I mean, really what you're investing in is the team. 
like, yes, the idea needs to be roughly in the general direction of where you'd like to see it. It's a category that you believe in. But more than anything, I mean, having a dynamic founder who knows how to um, think through different challenges, problems, having the right emotional IQ necessary um, to go through the hardships of being an entrepreneur. For a long time, I actually gave talks where I was questioning, I was like, why do people want to be entrepreneurs? Some of those just for years were actually during the growth stage of my company, not in the early days. Early days, it's fun to build. Everything's rosy and amazing, but it's like during the growth stage where I'm like, it's yours to lose, it's yours to win. You're responsible for an entire team, um, their livelihood, especially back in the day where I'm like, it wasn't as competitive of uh, industry. Um, so team matters a lot. I'm like, we tend to focus more on team than anything else. Uh, so the ideal founder is somebody who's dynamic, coachable, open to feedback. We're very hands-on mm -hmm. investors. We plug them into the network. We work with them through various challenges that they're gonna face and we've been there, we've done it all. Uh, there's very few encounters that an entrepreneur is gonna go through that somebody that I or somebody on the team hasn't. Um, but having that ability in somebody to be, to listen, um, be open to coaching, uh, walk in knowing all the various things that they don't know is incredibly important. And that's one of the key things that we look for. This is team and market, right? I mean, I, I wish I could have some other great uh, nugget of wisdom there, but I always go back to people who are a lot smarter than me. Uh, one of them is Andy Ratcliffe. Um, you know, he was a founder of Benchmark and now I think he's the kind of chairman or CEO of Wealthfront. And let me read you his quote. When a great team meets a lousy market, market wins. When a lousy team meets a great market, market wins. When a great team meets a great market, something special happens, right? And so that's what, that's what we're all doing. We're looking for this intersection of team and market. But I completely agree with Milun on the importance of team. And I'll tell you why. It's much easier to change and pivot your market than it is to change a team member, especially a founding team member, especially a CEO. It is really hard at the early stage to lose the inspiration behind the company. So I think it's team and market, obviously. Between the two, like Milun, I would choose team. Um, however, the question I also ask is why you and why now? What, what is your essential, this team, what is your essential added advantage that say six people in Google couldn't get through with $10 million and beat you in six months, right? So I call it my own Google challenge. <laughs> You know, and uh, so I think that is it. So team, market, between the two team, but why you and why now? When you exited out of Akamai uh, and then you started this other company, it failed and you started doing casual investing. At what were the first steps you took to starting a venture capital fund? Because you're like, okay, this is now what I want to do. And I think I've heard you say before that, you know, starting another company is, is really hard. I'd rather invest. So what were the first steps you took? Yeah. So I, I think, look, uh, first of all, you know, I, 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 I have to say that, you know, God had been kind. So, you know, I had flexibility and I could decide what I wanted to do next on my own terms, right? That's, that's much easier said than done, guys. Um, that was one. Um, number two, I realized, you know, working through my career that I'm happiest uh, when companies are less than 100 people, right? Uh, I think the politics are less, the issues are less, and you can really focus on building a company and working with your founders. Once you cross 50, 100 people, especially now in the US and California, HR rules, all this stuff comes in, it just gets much more complicated. And it's part of doing business, but, you know, you have to understand where you're good at. So then I decided that I would only do seed stage. Then it became, you know, what area will you invest in? And then I realized the only thing I know is enterprise software. And uh, even in 2000 and 2008, I think we've been proven correct. I always thought that probability adjusted B2B software companies will do uh, as well, if not better than B2C software companies. Yes, the odds of getting a hundred billion dollar company in B2C is higher. As we've all seen, uh, Akamai, even after all these years, is still less than 20 billion, which is a lot, but nothing compared to the Facebooks and Twitters and others of the world, right? And Google. So, um, so that was my thought process. And so I also realized that I would never be a passive investor. So even when I was investing my own money, I was on the board, either my partner or I were on the board and we were deeply engaged. So 
we realized that uh, Neeraj and I, my partner, decided that we would be deeply engaged investors from day one, even with our own money. We're not going to do any of the spray and uh, spray and pray stuff. We actually thought, you know, with our money, which was about you know seven million or so, that we would invest in ten companies. We only invested in four, right? And that taught us that enterprise software takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money uh, to get going. There's very few viral growth stories in enterprise software. It's usually a lot of blocking and tackling. Um, so we just, and we learned a lot on our own dime before we raised our own fund. The big question is, um, why do you want to start a fund? And then making sure that your reasoning for why you want to start a fund is going to match up with the expectations of what it's actually going to be when you start a fund. And the two tend to vary quite a bit because the amazing deals out there are very difficult to get into. Um, do you want to be somebody who's funding the companies that others are passing on? Do you want to try to identify those companies before they get to them? Or do you want to be competing against the term sheets? Um, so having a fund strategy in mind of how you're going to fit into the, um, um, the environment and then knowing the kind of companies, founders, um, is pretty crucial. Uh, the way that we approached it is we had years of building companies with various founders, um, as well as just different deals that we saw that led us down a path of like, hey, you know what? I think we should do this. I think there's uh, enough room in the market where we can be very hands-on investors coming off a very recent experience, having seen what success looks like, and then trying to scale that to more entrepreneurs rather than just a handful that we were doing per day. Um, so that's where I would start if I was anybody um, on this webinar, which is why do you want to do it? Um, how are you going to achieve it? And then making sure, and really talking to more people who have started, especially if it's going to be a micro fund, uh, making sure that the expectations line up with reality so you can avoid that disappointment after all the hard work that you've done. Sorry, I didn't answer the other question about Lloyd. You know, so I, the, the question uh, on the table was, you know, why not start another company instead of starting a fund, right? I think that's a great question. And for me, you know, I was already in my 40s and, you know, <laughs> It's really hard to run a company, okay, guys. Uh, you know, don't, don't, don't. There's, there's no other way about it. I'm actually acting CEO of one of my companies right now, um, until we find a new one. Uh, and I have so much appreciation for the job that entrepreneurs and CEOs do because it's really, really hard work. So I decided two things, two, three things. I know myself. I'm a little bit ADD. I was really happy at McKinsey in my early days when I had different problems every few months. I like working on different issues. So. Uh, a lot of people used to tell me, Pritesh, you should be a venture capitalist. I used to scoff at it uh, in the 90s and 2000s, but um, I guess they were right. And so I decided that, you know, this is what I like to do. I like seed stage. It's too much work, frankly, to start a company. And I wanted the portfolio effect. I wanted to make sure that I had investments in many companies to make sure that I'm not dependent on just one and that I didn't have all my eggs in one basket, uh, which was kind of my thinking at the time. But how did you handle the regulatory side of things? Just get a damn good lawyer, uh, you know, and they'll teach you everything about it. There, it there's, you can do some readings, but, you know, your signal when you get a good lawyer is not just uh, for yourself, it's to your LPs. Right? So you want to make sure you have a lawyer that's really good, that's done this very many times before. Uh, I chose a lawyer who I think I was his 406th fund, right? So, you know, he had you know, forgotten more than most people know about starting funds. And so that's, that's, the, that's the route I chose. Um, there's really no other way. It's going to cost you a little bit of money up front to do it. Um, it's well worth it. Well worth it, right? Do you want overseas investors? Do you want to be invest, able to invest in overseas companies? You know, so many things, so many rules. And just for example, I found it in 2012, and it may be different now, is just by saying I will not take overseas investors and I will not invest in overseas companies, my LP docs went down from 159 pages to 55 pages. Okay, just that one decision, right? So just be careful. In your first fund, just keep things simple. That's my advice to you guys. Keep it simple. Keep it 2% fees, 20% carry, straight down the fairway. It's your first fund. If you do well, you will make a lot of money later. Uh, and this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. Not much to add. I mean, honestly, get a good lawyer um, who's done it before. Don't be shy about telling them that it's like, hey, this is my first fund. 
what else should I know? Because there's a lot of regulations, things that you might not even think about. How do you market the fund? What are you allowed to say publicly? What are you allowed to say privately? Uh, the data room, what even are the reporting requirements that you need to do on a quarterly basis? Um, so yeah, get a good lawyer. They'll walk you through the whole thing. This isn't something that you need to be an expert in. Um, that's what they're there for. And a, a great lawyer will make a world of difference. They've been there, they've done it. They've seen how the big funds do it. They've seen how the small funds do it. Uh, and they'll handhold you all the way throughout. But one question here that I asked you know, is, yeah, you've invested your own money. What are the best tips for convincing others to invest into your fund? It's like a sales process. You just have to talk to a lot of people. You just have to talk and talk and talk. You have, you, you need to, you need to get that lead investor first, right? Um, I think you need one person apart from you guys that, uh, that is willing to say that we're going to put a, you know, $20 million fund. I, I realized that I needed one $3 million investor, right? So that was my goal. And the best way to do it is that people that know you. So I'm proud to say even till today that every every manager I've worked for probably is, has invested in my funds. So, you know, uh, people that you know, so I, I managed to get uh, a certain fund uh, that I had worked with in the past to put in $3 million and it kind of snowballed from there. So you need to get the people that you know best to put in some money. If they're not gonna put in money, it's very unlikely you'll get others. Just kind of continue off of that. Um, you do have talked to a lot of different LPs. Uh, the best way to raise is having some form of traction. Um, very similar to any startup that you might have. If you have traction, if you've done some angel investing in the past, if you've proven that you have a gut instinct for these kind of things so you can identify uh, talent and uh, new market trends, um, you'll be able to raise money. Um, yeah, in terms of approaching LPs, um, that's an entirely different one because uh, you can go to family offices, you have institutional, um, you have other founders uh, who are looking to put together smaller syndicates. Um, I've been an LP in four different funds and the ones that I appreciate the most are the ones that were always founder led. Um, it was somebody who I've seen be there, done that. I have faith that they're gonna be able to guide the founders in the right direction. And that's what led me investing in those. Um, today, I'm like, obviously I'm not, an LP in any uh, new fund going forward. Uh, but when we approach our LPs, I mean, we always go for our track record of both our intuition as well as our past performance. So for a lot of people on the call here, it might be their angel checks. You, you decided to start a fund. How did you define your fund's vision and strategy? Like what did the business plan look like? It was very organic. Uh, we were working with founders on a whole slew of different ideas. I mean, even within Expo, We've started on airline, aero.com, cybersecurity company, cmd.com, and content discovery, mix.com, which is um, a natural iteration of uh, Garrett stumble upon. Um, so when we created our thesis in the fund, we didn't target a specific category. Instead, we wanted to really target the best entrepreneurs. Um, as it was mentioned earlier on the call, a great team and a great entrepreneur working in a great category will do amazing things. And that was really kind of like our idea from day one. All I knew was enterprise software, right? So that, that part was easy. And I knew that I wanted to get in early. So uh, we also, you know, as, as uh, Milun said, we had a track record where we had invested in a few companies. Um, and uh, we put some of those, uh, uh, you know, those investments in this fund as kind of, a, you know, give me uh, some guaranteed return already. We put them at cost in the fund just to get people going. So you have to do something creative like that. People have put their entire investments at cost sometimes just to start a fund. Uh, for us, it wasn't so organic. It was actually we had to leave our jobs and, you know, do this full time. Uh, Neeraj and I decided to do that. But it was a, you know, the business plan, I look back, uh, back then, and you know, it was a thesis that we made that this specific market of enterprise software is going to continue to grow at a rapid pace, right? Um, and that thesis turned out to be correct. You have to have a thesis, you have to have data behind it, you have to have the background. And if you can have an incentive like we had, which is some investments at cost that you can give, that helps a lot. It helps a lot. Surprise, surprise, people love guaranteed returns, right? <laughs> Um, definitely. And then, and then in terms of, you know, I guess, you know, the thesis is easy. You, you, you gravitate towards your and your team's expertise and experience. And I guess that brings you some differentiated deal flow. But how do you calculate 
the right fund size for your thesis as a first timer? Is it like, let's get as much money as possible or as little, like what is the thought process there? Uh, for us, actually we were, and if I go back to my first deck, we said we would raise $20 million and do 12 investments. And that's exactly what we did, right? So we said we'll put between half a million and 1 million in the first round and, and save the rest for reserves, which I guess in a small fund is your rainy day strategy. It's not a reserve strategy really. Uh, so it worked out to plan. Uh, after that, those companies were doing well. We raised an opportunity fund for, uh, to invest in the ProRata, which has also done really well. But ultimately guys, your first fund must be a 3X. And that's my advice. It must be a 3X net minimum. So, you know, we thought at that point that we had a path with 12 investments, we had a model to turn 20 million net of fees, which is about, you know, 16 million into 60, right? So that was, that was the plan that we had, it worked out. Uh, if you don't have a plan to raise three, uh, to, to get a 3X multiple over eight to 10 years, then you shouldn't be in this business because your investors should be in the market. They're giving you an illiquid asset. So you, should, you have to do better than the liquid assets out there. So that's, you're talking about a 20, 25% plus IRR is what you need to achieve. So that's what our model showed. It worked out, not in the way that we expected as always, you know, but it worked out. And RN in terms of fund size, I mean, really kind of came down to two things. Uh, which is what kind of checks that we want to write that we want to do early stage, later stage. I mean, for anybody on this call, presumably it's going to be earlier stage. Um, so knowing your average check size, uh, what kind of equity position you want per company, and then just knowing your team's ability to be able to deploy the capital, but then also more importantly, support the companies. It's one thing to invest in 20 companies. It's another thing to invest and support and help those 20 companies. So if it's just um, a single GP in the fund, uh, it'd be very difficult to do a lot of investments. So you might want to consider doing a smaller fund uh, to prove your intuition in this market, uh, to showcase your network and ability to get into good deals, to provide value to those companies. But then it's also incredibly important to reserve some money for pro rata. I can't, you're like pro rata is really where a good number of the returns are. Um, and you really want to make sure that I'm like, you would hold those back in order to have those successful funds. Let's take some questions here from the audience Q&A. There's a whole bunch here. Uh, and then I'll dive into some of uh, uh, the others that I had. But what is uh, the capital requirement to start a VC fund? Like, you know, outside of the money you raise, like how much do you think should be reserved? Uh, if the capital requirement, how much we had to put in, we've always put in about 10% into the fund. So I assume that question was like other fees and whatnot, like all the all the operations side of things ah. get started and going. Yeah, you need, listen, uh, any good lawyer will tell you a lot of the fees actually comes out of the, the fund itself. Um, but yeah, you have to have a, a, a good lawyer. You have to have, there's another question I saw, so I'll take that now as well, a back office. We chose somebody called Standish. We chose not to do it ourselves. Now I have an in-house finance. I still have Standish, but in the middle you want, in the beginning you want, like I said, a good lawyer. You want a really good uh, back office administrator, right? Uh, that also doesn't start accruing. People know this business until you raise the fund. So apart from the actual money that you're putting into the fund, there's no real commitment in the beginning uh, to start a fund. Uh, lawyers and uh, back office administrators, which are the two major things, uh, actually happen after you start the fund. You don't pay it before. And then, uh, you know, Milun here, you know, there, there's a lot of these syndicates starting now on AngelList. And I have a very good friend, actually. Um, he recently started a fund on AngelList, pretty much. And uh, um, it's, it's the same 2 and 20% model. And uh, AngelList pretty much helps you kickstart a small fund and, um, you know, he had the good fortune of being in Udemy and Carbon Health and Outreach very, very early as early employees, small amounts of money there. And, uh, and so he recently started a fund. And um, what are your thoughts there? Is that like an MVP model of, of getting in there? Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of it. I mean, I, I don't know um, uh, everybody on the call in, in terms of like their ambition or where they are. Um, but if you haven't done a lot of angel investing, you're just looking to get started, it is a great way 
um, to get your feet wet to really kind of like see what the process is like. And if you want to save uh, some legal fees, it's a really easy entry point. Um, I've participated in a handful of those in the past simply because I'm like, yeah, I'm like, we're like the individual. And you have some uh, amazing investors who do syndicates on AngelList. Um, so it's a good way to start getting deal flow, start your uh, support to the different founders, uh, showing how you can enter the ecosystem, prove yourself, and then evolve from there. So if you're somebody who hasn't really done a lot of uh, investing in the past, um, you want to kind of like see how you would do, I think AngelList is a great way to start. Oh, AngelList lets you start funds, not even just a syndicate, because uh, my friend who just started this, it's an actual fund. I think it's a couple million dollar uh, fund writing small early checks. But uh, you know, I looked at the docs, AngelList facilitated uh, all the docs. And uh, and basically it said, hey, two, two and 20% and they manage all the legalese. So you can do that as well, which is quite interesting. I think what they've done is amazing. And I think if you, you know, getting back to the, our earlier point about, you know, getting some deals before you start a fund, I think that's a great way to do that. You know, if you don't have access for some reason, but this is what you want to do. I mean, what a, what an amazing platform they've built. Do you, do you still like, you know, like, like jumping, uh, this ties right into a uh, deal flow, right? Like uh, there's a f- number of questions here and how do you find differentiated deal flow what are your typical sources? Um, and, and so, you know, do you source from AngelList from time to time or like what is your methodology for finding the best differentiated deal flow? Well, if I tell you, I'd have to kill you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think, uh, look, they're, 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 this, is, this is an, um, it's a continued, continuing endeavor for excellence, right? I, I think deal flow, in my mind, I will never be good enough. Uh, I always think I need to get better, right? Um, so that's number one. Uh, but you have to understand where you stand in the ecosystem, right? I mean, we are not Sequoia. We are not Axel. We are not Benchmark, right? That's number one. So that that's that sets you back, right? Then, you know, I'm not, neither Neeraj or me were uh, really good at marketing or tweeting or any of these things. That's that's not who we are. And we realized you can't, you can't become something you're not. I can never be Brad Fell, right? He writes so well. He, uh, he tweets so well in the beginning, you know, this. So... You have to understand what we are good at. So what we are really good at is at that time we decided was, you know, reaching out to immigrant founders, especially South Asians. Uh, we did the math. 50% of all South of all startups in the Bay Area had an, uh, you know, South Asian co-founder. So we were like, okay, that's an interesting uh, statistic. This is a report that came out of Berkeley in 2012. Uh, we figured that anecdotally, it's probably even higher than in the enterprise. So that's what we did. We just went out and talk to as many people as we could, you know, directors, senior directors, VPs at, at, at these companies, VMware, Cisco, all these companies that we knew would be the ones turning out and starting companies. So that was our differentiated deal flow. Uh, now that is, of course, capitalized. We've got a couple of other partners. They've got a great deal flows from their histories in Stanford and so on. Now you have incubators, right? You've got so many of them. We attend all the demo days, try to see, you know, which ones are the enterprise and interesting, uh, are interesting. University incubators, MIT, Berkeley, USC, et cetera, have been very, very useful for us. So, you know, it's now become an issue from just, you know, reach out to actually getting all these data points in a structured way and figuring out, you know, which companies are interesting because there's so many companies you can just get inorganically through all these incubators as well. Milun, you guys have a pretty solid brand with Expa and Garrett and yourself. And you guys are on the circuit there with like, you know, having Uber and then stumble upon and a whole bunch of other companies. How do you, do you guys have difficulty finding deal flow or like, how do you find good deal flow? Yeah, I I mean, your reputation is everything in this industry. Um, You need to um, want people to want to work with you. Um, And that comes with years of demonstrating value to the ecosystem, uh, as well as to other VCs. Um, A lot of the other top tier VCs that we work with who either come in after us or we're participating in their rounds or they're participating rounds um, come because I'm like, they have familiarity with us. They know how we work. They know how we add value to the founders. Uh, and they've seen um, how we try to go over and beyond just capital for a lot of the investments that we do. Um, another um, one to mention, and for a long time, I didn't see a ton of value in it, but I, I have to say demo days are great. 
uh, demo days, be it by YC, be it by uh, a, any of the other programs that are out there, you'll get exposure to different companies, different founders. And again, if you're starting off, what you're looking for is exposure. You want to get as many half an hour, one hour meetings per week with as many founders as you get, because the name of the game is pattern recognition. And the pattern recognition is like, I recognize what they're going through. I know how, how I can help them. I can deploy some money. I'm going to give them value. And in turn, as that company grows, you're going to get some recognition for your contribution into that company. And hopefully that's more than just capital. And as a result, both that founder is going to be appreciative. They're going to meet other amazing founders just in their circles as they go to conferences, as they talk to other founders, and you start getting those referrals. So most of the deals that we do today are not called outreaches, nothing like that, but it's other VCs inviting us into their deals. Uh, it's founders recommending other founders because we've added value or believed in them when maybe others haven't, or we helped them raise the round that helped get them to the next stage. But really the key is making sure that you're adding value over and beyond capital when you're in this game. There's so much competition um, and more and more people are investing, angel investing, there's angel lists and all of this stuff. How do you advise people to build a strong value prop and uh, differentiate your fund really from other people? I mean, your expertise, your thesis, uh, your network, of course, is part of that. But like, are there any other key points to touch on? We talked a lot about the first fund formation, which is, you know, your background, your deal flow and your history, right? I mean, but after your first fund, that honeymoon period is lost. Now you got to show performance, right? And so... You know, if you're not a top quartile fund uh, and you're not a brand name, it's really hard to raise subsequent funds, actually, right? It's not, and that's how it should be. Uh, that's, you know, that's exactly how it should be. I'm not a big believer in, you know, this two-year cycle of funds. I think the three-year cycle of funds is much healthier, but that's the way the industry is going these days. We haven't changed our point of view, but look, once you've raised your fund, then, then you get back to the business of, you know, making money for yourself and your investors. And, you know, there's, it's not easy. So I think one point I'd like to take, while I, I, I do think that there's very few better jobs in the world than venture capital. And the reason that I say that is that, you know, as Milun was saying, two, two plus days of our life is spent, you know, with entrepreneurs who are trying to change the world, right? I mean, how, how, how incredible is that? Um, that said, it's a very hard business, right? Uh, your returns are few, are, are, are far away. Sometimes you get lucky, but, you know, that's rare. Uh, you know, the average time to get into the Midas list, I think, is north of 15 years, right, of being in the business. So, you know, you have to be, uh, uh, you have to have a very long-term view and you have to be really passionate about trying to help your founders. If you are an engaged fund, if you're a spray and pray, uh, spray and pray fund, then all you're doing is trying to find the founders and that's when your job ends. Our model was, you know, we'll spend a lot of time in deep flow, but we'll spend a lot of time working with our founders on boards and becoming their trusted advisors. So I think, you know, raising, you know, of course, deal flow is a big part of the equation, but working with the founders to maximize value, I think is a huge part of the equation as well. And differentiation is incredibly difficult. I mean, there's more funds, there's more capital out there than ever before. Uh, but the good news is there's more entrepreneurs, more ideas and more people executing on ideas than ever before. Um, the way that we differentiate, and again, it's very difficult. I'm not even saying we're successful at it because we do um, lose deals and we do win deals when we go up against the Sequoias and others of the world. Um, but we've been there, done that. So having that firsthand knowledge of what the founder is embarking on, what they're going through, what they're about to go through, and them having the comfort that you're the right partner with them to help guide them, see them, and support them through the difficult journey that's ahead of them um, is crucially important. And that's why I'm, like, hey, hey, I'm probably sounding like a broken record at this point in time, um, but so, so important to keep demonstrating value. Show the founders how you can, uh, how you can help them, show them how you're gonna be there for their success and their company's success, and eventually you will build that brand. Just like every other company that enters a very crowded market, the ones with the best product that demonstrate value to the customers, listen to their customers, iterate and continuously improve, will make it past the noise. Definitely. And this ties into a couple of questions here around what percentage of time should be dedicated 
to guiding your portfolio companies, helping your portfolio companies versus uh, finding new deal flow? Yeah, I mean, the answer is a lot. Now it varies based on the stage of the companies you're investing in, the kind of founders you're investing in. I mean, we have amazing founders with high pedigrees that you invest capital. And quite frankly, Mike, they don't need a lot of your help. They've been there. They've done that. They are amazing what they do. They'll hit you up for a couple of intros. You reach out, you kind of catch up with them. They might emotionally vent to you over a couple of things. They just want to be heard. Uh, and then that's it. And then you have other founders who are still sometimes in the ideation stage. We will invest in pre-seed and we do help founders filter through their ideas, help them strategize. And you do really have to spend a lot of time with them. You have to tap into your network. You have to do the intros. You need to follow up with them. Um, yeah, I, I might be, and to give you an example, I mean, there's a handful of other VCs that we work with that I, I remember the Synchrony reaching out to one. He's like, um, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be doing any investments for the next month. I really want to double down on helping my portfolio grow and seeing where I could support them because he just went for a couple of weeks of deploying quite a bit of capital. So the ratio, I don't think there's a golden rule or anything that I could say here. I think it's highly dependent on the kind of founders and the stage that you invest in. Uh, but the answer is a lot. Yeah, I think, look, I, I, I agree with everything Vilun said. I think there's, there's, there's no golden rule, first of all. Uh, that, that's number one. Uh, I think Milun will also agree with me that we all want to invest in founders who do everything themselves and we don't have to do any work, right? I mean, I mean those are the best companies. It happens once a fund, if you're lucky, right? Where you find this founder who's just, they're just on the, you know, you don't have to really do that much. You have to be there as an advisor if and when needed and it, you know, it's all great. But the truth of the matter is most of our founders are first time founders. So while they are trying to create value, they're also learning for the first time how to build a company. What does it take, right? Uh, the same questions that, that you guys have, right? You know, how do you start? You know, when do you start selling? When do you start, you know, when do you raise your customer? When do you hire your first customer success person? You know, when, when do you hire a senior salesperson, junior? What are the sales comp plans, right? You know, so um, what's the financial modeling needed for SaaS, which is very different from the old days because you know, you're not getting all the money up front, right? So. So what's the right amount of money to raise now? Series A, what's the right amount of dilution now? Series A, right? Well, how much should I pay my, my VP of engineering? There's so many questions that these, these guys have. You can only add value. And the only point I'd like to add to what Milun said is if you have a trusted relationship with your founder. The time I know I have a trusted relationship is when things are going bad and I am the first call. That's when you know that you're a trusted advisor, right? It's like, it's like your child, right? You want to be the first call for your child when things are not going well. That's my goal with my sons. You know, I just want to be the first call, right? Similarly with my founders, I want to be the first call, right? And for that to happen, I have to add value to them. I have to show them that I can indeed, I'm capable and worthy of being your advisor. And that onus is not on them. It is on me. It's on me to prove that, right? So that's what I strive to do always with my founders. And the more they involve me, the more value I can add. If I don't know the problem, how do I help? I can't, right? So I think if you focus back at the end of the day, doing the right thing, not getting too high when things are going well, not getting too low when things are going badly, and you be there, you know, they're confidant, that's when you actually can add value. You guys are proactive with your portfolio companies and helping them out. Uh, through the journey and helping them succeed, which is which is great. Um, how do you calculate risk versus reward? Like you know, um, um, in, like in terms of investment, you guys are looking at hundreds of companies. How do you make investment decisions? Um, you know, a lot of people say, yeah, it's all guesswork. Uh, this VC game is BS. It's all guess. It's all luck. But like uh, you know, in between luck and guess. Uh, and spray and pray, and on the other side, money ball, there's some reality in between, right? And what is that reality? You know, in SaaS, it's a little bit different from consumer, right? So in, in B2B, there's few things that you know. You know the competition, you know the customer, you know what price the customer is paying to the competition, even if it's zero, right? A lot of companies are created just to you know, get people off Excel, which they're using, right? For which they're pretty much not paying anything, right? So so you have a few of these 
uh, variables, if you will, that you can input into this equation. That said, it's an art form, guys. But we will not invest in anything unless it has the potential to return the fund, right? So my current fund is 78 million. If I'm gonna put 4 million in a fund, I'm betting that this is a 20X, right? That's what I'm betting, right? So, so I think that is the way we look at it, uh, that it does, we do not think that this has the potential to return the fund in its entirety, we don't invest. So a lot of people are playing the unicorn game. We are playing what's called the dragon game, which is a fund returner. Or they touched upon the importance of the team and a founder. I mean, by far, that's the biggest thing. Is this founder dynamic enough to really navigate the intricacies of the challenges ahead? Um, and that could come in many forms. It could be uh, a need for the company to pivot. It could be uh, founder issues and having the ability to resolve those uh, team dynamics. Um, but that aside, you have to look at the market. What market are they going to play in? Is it a really niche market? Is it something where the entire customer base is 100? Is it well-defined? Um, so TAN matters quite a bit. Um, that aside, I mean, as you look through hundreds of companies, I mean, over time, and I've probably looked through thousands of different decks, like you start developing pattern recognition ability. Um, you start seeing the patterns in founders who have fought through all the different angles of at least their initial approach and founders who are just kind of like heading in a general direction and founders who may be over optimistic uh, in terms of how easy it might be to get somewhere. Um, so you have to take a lot of these things into consideration when you're making an investment decision and figuring out who you're going to back, but also like where you're going to be spending your time. Because like any investment, I'm like, you're investing two things, which is capital and your time. So you also want to make sure that, hey, is this a category that I want to spend time in? Is this a category that I want to learn more about? Because naturally you will. Uh, but then you also have, um, that was already mentioned, like uh, B2B companies, a little bit more straightforward. You could call up a couple of individuals in your network. You can even do a cold call and try to figure out, like, is this a big problem? How much would they potentially pay for it? Is this something urgent and they're looking for an immediate solution? Or is this something that might be a problem a couple of years from now, like GDPR, like back when it was announced compared to back when it, when it was implemented? Um, whereas consumer can be a little bit tricky. I mean, when I did Metro Lyrics, I mean, changing the color of a button would like increase the happiness and, un and decrease the happiness of various individuals just based on colors. Like you don't experience those always in like B2B. So B2C takes a little bit more of that finessing, like, hey, did I get lucky? Is it like the right timing? Is it right there? But it also takes a lot of hard work. B2B, a little bit easier, simply because you get those cold, hard answers up front. Definitely. Some last uh, closing questions here. We're getting to the top of the hour. This was a, a fantastic session. I learned a ton. Maybe after boast, uh, I might start my fund and <laughs> take some more advice from you guys. But uh, uh, what are some books or, or uh, resources you'd recommend for people or something that you're reading right now? Maybe. Yeah, look, uh, I think there's uh, lots of great blogs from Brad Feld and Fred Wilson, um, Bill Gurley. I think these are all phenomenal blogs from people that have, you know, not just done it once, but done it repeatedly, right? I, I, I have just the highest regard for these guys. Everybody should read Benjamin Graham. You, sh you should read Warren Buffett's annual letters uh, to his investors. Um, you, you must read the Venture Deals, by the way, the one by Brad Feld. Um, and I think in general, uh, you know, try to read three nonfiction books a month. I, I picked that up. Uh, somebody I know knows Bill Gates really well, and that's what he tries to do, right? So you have to continue, you know, honing your interests in different ways. For example, right now, I, I book as much as, um, uh, uh, you know, I read as much of Quantum as I can right now. I think that's the next big thing. I don't know when it comes. Uh, but as Milon will tell you, in our industry, uh, you know, it's it's too early until it's too late, right? It just happens really fast. Uh, Blue Ocean Strategy is a book that I remember reading many years ago that really kind of opened up my eyes about how to think through markets. Um, other than that, I mean, just, I mean, first-hand experience, you can't beat it. And it doesn't necessarily need to be first-hand experience doing the angel investments, but I'm like, Go talk to more VCs, go attend more of these webinars. Uh, the more you can interact with people who are in the field, the more you're going to learn. 
Um, and, and even when you get started in this industry, I mean, you're going to be out there. You're going to be talking uh, with founders, entrepreneurs. So the more you get out there, the more you are network, uh, the closer you're going to get to your answers. I'm going to ask one last question. We'll take it with Milun um, and then over to Pratish. As you look back over the last several years, what do you wish you did more of and what do you wish you did less of? Great question, Milan. <laughs> that is a great question. So I got to go first here. Um, okay, so what did I, uh, what I wish I did more of which was probably stay in touch with some uh, amazing founders and entrepreneurs uh, who I've lost contact with. Um, very, very easy to get caught up in life, uh, be too busy, just kind of like pass by encounters where I'm like, maybe you have one or two amazing dinners when you're in SF, um, but then you just kind of like let time pass and they're busy, you're busy. And before you know, it's been like a couple of years that passed by. Um, having the discipline of going through some kind of personal relationship management system um, of staying in touch with the network, really kind of like building that network if this is a path that you want to go down, uh, both to expand your knowledge, but also to stay in touch with relevant individuals, relevant circles, and talented founders um, is absolutely crucial. So that's something I wish I did. Uh, but at the same time, I'm like, I was working on multiple startups and I was very heads down and investing is a long-term game. You need to start early. You need to develop your network early. You can't be heads down, wake up one morning and be like, okay, today I'm going to get started. You should have probably got started before. What I wish did less of is I guess the opposite of that. Uh, less heads down, working uh, a little bit more of uh, opening yourself up socially to other circles, other founders, uh, other networks, and really just kind of like seeing what is out there. So you could better form both your thesis and your opinions on both the markets and how you're gonna approach into it. So I think what I wish I had done more often I'm trying to do is, is just market better. Um, you know, every time I go to a potential LP, they're saying, you know, you know, your performance is completely out of touch with your marketing. We've never heard of you guys. And it irritates me no end. And my answer always is, would you rather have performance or marketing? And they obviously say performance, but it doesn't explain the fact that we have not been pretty good at marketing up front. So working it, continue to work it. But, you know, um, that's with something that I wish I had done more of. What I wish I had done less of is working with my companies that are not doing so well. <laughs> But, you know, it's uh, when you have, you know, 40 companies in your portfolio, you're going to have some of those. It's also very rewarding when you land them, though. It is very rewarding when you land them. Uh, but, um, you know, and also a lot of the back office stuff. I'm also the CFO of the fund. I wish I had done let off, less off. But that's, you know, that's a necessary evil, if you will. You have to do it. Uh, but before we go on, I think my, my you know, there's a question on that list, uh, Lloyd, uh, about women. Um, and it's kind of my, uh, you know, something that's close to my heart. I, I still find it really hard to, feel, to, to find a lot of female entrepreneurs. And, you know, some of the best, you know, uh, Edith at uh, Launch Darkly um, is, is a fantastic founder. I think Annalisa Gooden and Catch and Release, you're going to hear a lot about her. The, the, the ones that we find are phenomenal. So uh, I don't have an easy answer to the question. It is a systemic issue, but I would love to meet and invest in as many female founders as I could possibly find. Well, fantastic, guys. I enjoyed, I, I love this. Uh, it's a little offbeat than we've uh, done the typical business growth type sessions. And uh, this was suggested by Pratish when we were catching up uh, last month. So glad uh, this came about and I, I, it's a lot of great insights. And thank you, Milun, for joining us. Uh, both perspectives have been phenomenal and look forward to having you at future attraction events. And thanks everyone for joining us. I need some traction.